So this is the, the last of a series um, about the nine gifts that God, has, God by His Holy Spirit has, has given the church. Um, and I'm really excited about today because today we're going to talk about prophecy, we're going to talk about speaking in tongues, and we're going to talk about interpretation of tongues. Isn't that good? And then we're going to send you out of here empowered, imparted, and, and you're going to, this is a proclamation, you're going to begin to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or should I say it this way, the Holy, you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to manifest Himself through you. Um, it's not a passive thing, though. He doesn't take over your body and make you do things. So you have to be the willing vessel. You have to have the mouth that's going to open and speak the words, or you're going to have to be the one that has the hands that are laid on the sick. You're going to have to be the one that is a doer of the word. Amen? Amen. How many of you want to see God use you in supernatural, powerful ways to bring glory to his name? If you didn't raise your hand, I'm, I'm like, do you have a pulse? <laughs> Come on. So, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that he didn't want them to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. So, if you write somebody and tell them about something and you tell them you don't want them to be ignorant about it, that means that they were ignorant about it, or they were misinformed, they had bad information, or they had no information, correct? Correct? So that's why he wrote the letter, and I think it'd be foolish for me to stand up here and think that every single one of you know everything there is to know about spiritual gifts. And of course, I don't know everything there is to know about spiritual gifts, so we're kind of on a journey together to learn more about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in and through us. So isn't that a good reason to write a letter? Isn't that a good reason to bring a teaching? So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit. As we give our lives to you, you give us yours, and you indwell us with your Holy Spirit, which is, by the way, the Holy Spirit is a third of the Godhead. That's amazing, and he lives within me. So God, I pray that as we go through this, your Holy Spirit would teach us the things that, that I say. God, I pray that you would life them to our spirits, to our emotions, to our mind, to our bodies even. And God, I pray that if I'm missing things or if I'm, if I'm mess, messing things, I pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bring clarity and correction and that we would, we would leave here uh, better equipped to be your, your ambassadors in this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I am getting better, praise God. Keep praying for me. Now, he also said to the church in Corinth, actually he said it twice, I want you to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. I want you to earnestly desire the greater gifts. So it's not wrong for you to want to be used by God supernaturally. Aren't you glad about that? I want to be used by God supernaturally. I can't wait to see people healed. We've seen it before. I want to see it more. How about you? You want people to come in here? I want to see people come in here with obvious I don't want to see them come in here with obvious illnesses. I want to see them leave here without their obvious illnesses. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> I, want to see them, I want to see them changed by the glory, for the glory of God by His Holy Spirit. I want to see miraculous things happen in your lives and mine. I want to see miraculous things happen in this community. I want to see, I want to see words spoken like Kyle gave us today that, t that just lift the stuff off from you. How many of you are ministered to by that word? I mean, how many of you have been going through stuff? It's like, this is painful, this stinks, this can't be God. And he comes and says, it's okay. This is part of the plan. There's a birth coming. That's awesome. So desire gifts. And, and he says it again. He says, pursue love, yet desire spiritual gifts. Now, the, whole, the interesting thing is, we've got 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts in the body of Christ and how they interact. And then he's got chapter 14 where he's bringing teaching about prophecy and tongues and, and, and how, what, what it looks like when we come together. But sandwiched in the middle of that, he has a whole chapter on love. Isn't that pretty cool? Because all of this without being done in love is nothing. That's what he says. You know, you could lay hands on the sick and see them recover, but if it's not out of love, it's nothing. You could give everything you own to the poor 
and if it's not out of love, you've accomplished nothing. Wow, you could know all mysteries? Wouldn't that be wild? But it would be nothing without love. So pursue love, yet desire spiritual gifts. It's not either or, it's both. Now there, so this is our chapter, this is our scripture. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. Who is that spirit? Can you say this out loud with me? Jesus is Lord. You know that you can't say that unless it's the Holy Spirit in you saying it? That's what my Bible says. Jesus is Lord. So it's Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is the source of them all. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is the source of everything good. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. Why do we have these gifts? So I can build a platform and I can be known because I have a spiritual gift of healing. Isn't that what it says? No, it's for each other. We are given gifts for each other. Uh, so when we're operating in these gifts, it should always be about the other person, not about you. You're not the big showboat because you laid hands on somebody and they got healed. All you are is a vessel that the Holy Spirit chose to use to bring healing into somebody else's life. That keeps it in perspective. Each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It is the one and only Spirit who dis distributes all these gifts. Are we sure we're on the right? No, we're not in the right PowerPoint. That's the wrong PowerPoint, by the way. So I could teach that, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> I thought we were reviewing a lot. Review is good, amen? And the beginning of each teaching was the same, so uh, we're in week three, so it should be part three, it's in planning center. Uh, but let's, let's just kind of dig in, I'll read it from here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, this morning, it's because of Michael Shanowski. It's all your fault, Michael, because I told, I told Melanie, you make me look good, and, and Mike said to her, make him humble. <laughs> oh, make him look humble. Uh. So anyhow, if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 7. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. That's the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern a message from the Spirit of God from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which each, per which each gift should get. So did we fix it? We good? I'm good? Yay, prophecy. So prophecy is the next one listed. We ended last week with faith. So now we're going to talk about prophecy. What is prophecy? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that use the word prophecy or prophesy, not necessarily even in a Christian environment, correct? But the word prophecy means the ability to speak in a language understood by the believer, words that are inspired and given by the Holy Spirit. That's our definition as Christians of, of what prophecy is. It's the ability to speak. So um, you could write it because Kyle wrote it this morning and I spoke it, right? But it's the ability to transmit a message from, the, from God by the Holy Spirit. This is a miraculous thing. This isn't something you studied and figured out. This is special revelation. And I don't mean special revelation in a way that ever goes against this. Ever. If somebody says something contrary to this, run. If somebody says that they had an encounter with an angel and they gave them another book, 
Uh, run. This is it. This is the full and complete revelation that we have. Amen? So, so the ability to speak, so there's an action that takes place. You have to speak it or write it, transmit it in some way so that the hearer can understand it. And it's in a language that you know. Uh, every single one of you has the potential to prophesy. If you're a born-again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of the living God in you, you have the capacity, the ability. God says He wants you to prophesy. He says to desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. Why would He tell you to desire it and then not give it to you? That'd be pretty mean. So, every, without exception, and I don't care if you're four or 400. Well, 400, it might be hard to transmit, but anyhow. Age has nothing to do with it. Um, age in the Lord has nothing to do with it. Maybe some of the best people to prophesy are those that don't have a head full of stuff. Every one of us can prophesy. Um, Acts chapter 2, Peter is transmitting what Joel said, and he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't say all believers here. He says all people. When the last days come, we're going to see some amazing things that we can't even understand. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. How many of you are a son? How many of you are a daughter? Guess what? You're a son or a daughter. And you will prophesy, it says. And he says, men and women alike, this is not just for the men of the church, this is every single believer in Jesus Christ will prophesy, can prophesy, should prophesy, I would add. Sons and daughters. Here's an example that we find in the book of Acts. Philip was, remember, Philip was one of the deacons, but he was an evangelist. But he had some daughters, and depending on your version, in the New Living, it says he had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. In other versions, and I think in the original language, it says that they were prophets, prophetesses. So they were in the office of the prophet. They were not very old. You know how old you were when you got married, when Philip was alive? 13, 14, 15? So these are unmarried daughters. They're probably 12, 13 years old, and they're prophesying. Come on. I want to see our teenagers prophesying. Can I say that again? You guys didn't sound that excited about that. I want to see our teenagers prophesying. Because when prophecy comes, you know what happens when prophecy comes? The, 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 everything goes up. Everything goes up because words are spoken that bring life, that bring encouragement, that bring hope. And it doesn't have to come from Pastor Mike. It can come from Easton. It can come from Nia. It can come from Nisi. And come from Addie. One of you had a birthday again this week, right? Abby had a birthday? Okay. We won't, we won't embarrass you, Abby. Happy birthday, Abby. We won't embarrass you. <laughs> Veronica, it could be you that God wants to prophesy even today. Who knows? Now, Kayo is a pretty quiet, reserved woman of God, right? So... Maybe she didn't have the courage to stand up and speak it, but she still made sure it got transmitted. So maybe you don't have the courage, but find a way. If God's given you a word, submit it to me. Submit it to one of the elders and say, I think this is from God. That's a really safe way to be able to, to, to learn how to prophesy. Now, prophesy, proph prophecy does not necessarily have to be some weird mystical thing. You don't have to get into this weird space to prophesy. I used to think that, because, you know, I'm a charismatic Pentecostal. I used to think you had to be weird to be used by God. You don't. I don't want to be weird. I want to be, be weird in the world's eyes, because I love Jesus, and I'm willing to do stupid, crazy things when he puts it on my heart, but I don't want to have to be one of those people that's all goofy to be used by God. No, sometimes he uses the foolish to confound the wise. Amen. Sometimes he does things that are absolutely like, well, that's weird. Um, for example, Jesus took clay, spit in it, and stuck it in a dude's eye. 
I mean, I don't care who you are, that's weird. That's just like, that is out of the box. So sometimes, and sometimes he shows up in ways you don't expect, and it can be scary. Because I read about the, the disciples were in the boat, and the storm came up, remember that? And they're, they're all afraid they're going to die. And here comes this, that's a ghost. There's a ghost walking across the water. They're all petrified. And Jesus says, no, it's not a ghost. It's me, you people of little faith. But they were scared because he came in a way that they didn't expect. Think about that. Sometimes he does that. So prophecy. He who prophesies, speaks. These are big words, right? Edification. What does edification mean? Building up. Edifice, you know, when you see a building, it's an edifice. The building up. It speaks building up. Building up. is Prophetic words don't tear down. Prophetic words build up. They, they, their exhortation. What does exhortation do? Encouraging. So it builds you up and encourages you. It might provoke you in the right way, but it's this, it's this building up and it's this encouragement. Isn't anybody not want to receive building up encouraging words? You don't want to hear them? I want to hear them. I need them. And, and then comfort. How many of you have ever needed just a word of comfort? I think for some this morning, the word that Kayo had was comforting. The pain you're going through, it's okay, it's going to end, and it's going to bring life. And then it's to men, it's to people. So when you're prophesying, you're not just prophesying out into space, you're prophesying to people. So number one, prophecy speaks to people. Speaks to people. I've heard people prophesy to the wind and prophesy. To, I don't know. I'm not saying it's wrong, but this says to people. Amen? Number two, speaks words understood by the speaker and to the hearers. So we're going to talk about tongues and interpretation, but when a prophetic word is given, it's understood by the speaker, whoever it is that's speaking it or writing it or whatever. It's understood by the hearer. So it's clear communication. Clear communication is always better than unclear communication. And it builds up the church. So prophecy in the church should always build individuals up, but it also should build up the church. Because when you're built up as an individual, I would hope that that brings us all up. That's what I mean by the prophetic, bringing us all up a level. And the other thing that prophetic words do is it releases other spiritual gifts and it releases people to operate in those gifts. It, you, may, you may know, that and, you know, it's like, man, I think God wants me to lay hands on the sick and blah, 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 you know, it's like, but I don't know. How many of you have ever received a word? I know I have. I see you laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. That's a prophetic word. And it's releasing, it's imparting. So sometimes it goes beyond just encouraging you. It actually sets you free to be who you are. See how important prophetic words are? We need to prophesy more. Now, I will put a caution out there. Um, I don't know if we need sidewalk prophets. We don't need disorder in our prophetic. If you read 1 Corinthians 14, it's all about order. God is a God of order. It actually has a whole plan in there. You know, if people are prophesying in church, there should only be one or two, and then let the others judge. So if you're going to, pro now, I know this is a scary thing, and this is not meant to, to squash you from prophesying, but if you're going to prophesy publicly, then if you're wrong, you're going to be corrected publicly. I don't want to be that person that does it. But how else do you correct something? If you have all heard something, how else would you correct it other than telling you all? So a good place to practice and to learn is in a life group. That's an ad for life groups. Get in one, find one, start one. Find, in, find that place. I mean, you can come on Wednesday nights and pray. We can prophesy and pray. They're kind of closely related. So, 
when Paul says desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy, I think he meant it. So the next one listed is discerning of spirits. Now, I find it interesting. I've been around the church a long time, and most of the time when people are talking about this particular manifestation or gift, they say, I have the gift of discernment. No, usually the people that think they have the gift of discernment are just critical people that have an axe to grind. There's no such gift as the gift of discernment. It's not listed in there. Did you catch that? That's not a spiritual gift. That's probably a wound in your heart that makes you think you've got to be better than everybody else. I can't believe I just said that in public. It is the truth, but it's no fun to hear, is it? It's no fun to say either. But discerning of spirits is different. Discerning of spirits is a particular discernment ability to discern the spirit behind something. So let's get into the definition. To discern means to recognize and distinguish between. It doesn't mean to judge, by the way. It says to recognize the di- and distinguish between two things. And in this case, two spirits. And I love this description. This is uh, by Derek Prince, believe it or not. Say, seeing what is there in the natural, but seeing it with the understanding of the Holy Spirit. I like that description. So you, you walk into a room, and somebody's there, and they're, and they're ministering, and you get this check in your spirit, and you're like, something's just not right. Anybody ever been there? Now, that doesn't mean you get critical. That doesn't mean you get judgmental. That doesn't mean you go tell everybody that guy is whacked. That means that you open up your antennas, and you say, God, what's going on here? And let him lead you into further discernment. And then you've got to decide what you're going to do with that. You need the word of wisdom at that point. I believe my wife operates in this, spirit, this spiritual gift, um, especially when we're on the mission field, especially when we're encountering people that are in ministry, and it's really a safeguard for you and for me and for the church. Because somebody needs to be able to distinguish between what's the Holy Spirit and what's just a spirit. Because every spirit is not the Holy Spirit. So we could, we could spend a long time on that subject, but um, actually we could probably spend a week on each one of these, in all fairness. And I did a message on tongues back in 2013. I found it online, and I will post it on our Facebook group if you want to listen to it. I don't have, that's about 45 minutes, and it's all about tongues. I don't have 45 minutes to talk about tongues today. But the interesting thing is, as I, I listened to it this week, you ever listen to yourself teach or preach? It's hard. It's like, I, I sound like that. So anyhow. Actually, I do it quite often because I'm trying to be better at it, believe it or not. So tongues. There's three different expressions of tongues at least, and we're going to go over those quickly, um, but just so you know that I'm not making this stuff up, it says in 1 Corinthians 12.10, to another different kinds of tongues. And the word kinds there is the word that we get genre from, So, if, like the genre of music. So how many of you like uh, classical? How many of you like country? Hey, some people admit it. I like country rock. I don't like twangy country. I don't, I'm not into... How many of you like... Um, what's the stuff with the fiddles and the banjos? Bluegrass. How many of you like bluegrass? See, it's a good thing I didn't say anything bad about it because some people like it, right? My pastor has a beautiful, beautiful voice and he's got out two CDs. I have his CD in my car I love him and I love his voice, but I just, I haven't made it all the way through yet. No, it's like the Gatlin Brothers or something. I don't know what it is. What is it, Scott? Help me. It's a different genre than what I enjoy. But it's awesome. The Gaithers, not the Gatlins. Yeah, the Gaithers. And he, even he said, he said he went to a Gaither's concert a long time ago, and it was packed out, and it was a bunch of young people, and it was awesome. The last one he went to, he said it was a bunch of old people, and they, were, they all had white sneakers. And <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> that 
That's what he said. It's like, what happened? All, these, all, these, all of their fans got older, is what happened. <laughs> what? <laughs> that happens, that happens. So there's different kinds of tongues. Now, I've experienced this. I think, I think you can take this two ways. I, I speak in tongues. I pray in tongues. Um, I've been used in the gift of tongues publicly. Um, but my prayer language is interesting. Even in that, there's different expressions of my prayer language, depending on what's going on. I got my normal one that I pray in, but then if things start to get intense, my language changes, and the intensity of it changes. And I'm like, oh, this is different. Now, by the way, when you speak in tongues, it's still you. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and, oh, I'm going to be a puppet. No, I'm not a puppet. I choose to speak in tongues. I choose to pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit doesn't take over. Amen? So there's different kinds of tongues, and we're going to go over those. First, there's the miraculous ability to speak in a language unknown by the speaker, but known to the hearers. We see that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out, and the people that are there began to speak in other languages. But they're not just speaking nonsense. They're not just speaking angelic languages or whatever. They're speaking the languages of the people that are in the city for Passover. No, not for Passover, for Pentecost. So the hearers understood what they're saying. They didn't understand what they're saying, but the hearers understood. So it would be like me um, going to the Dominican Republic and getting off the plane and speaking perfect Spanish without ever taking a lesson. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> or... Um, a quick testimony, and I shared this in 2013. How many of you were here in 2013? So when I was at the Dominican, I was at the, at the out in L.A. at uh, the Dream Center, I met a guy. He was, a, he was a, a disciple. He had gone through the program. It's kind of like Teen Challenge. They have a program. He'd gone through the program, and now he's on staff. And he's a Mexican guy. Doesn't speak Spanish. I don't know if I really understand that. You live in Southern California, you're Mexican and don't speak Spanish. But he didn't speak Spanish. His father was a pastor, and he got into trouble with drugs and alcohol or whatever and ended up in this program. And part of the program, they had to go on an outreach to Tijuana. So he goes to Tijuana, and they tell him, you and this other guy go door to door. He's like, I don't speak Spanish. He doesn't speak Spanish. Don't worry about it. Just go. So they went, and he knocked on the first door, and he began to speak in perfect Spanish, spoke Spanish all day long, had never spoken Spanish before or since. Now that's pretty cool. How come I can't get that? I can. Desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. And that's, that's technically prophecy because the hearer is understanding it. Nope. That's the way it is. So... That's the first one. The second one, and notice I put miraculous ability. This is, every single one of these things are miraculous abilities. These are not things that, that you learn or a skill. This is miraculous ability by the Holy Spirit. Let me just go back to this one for a second. So, um, the Holy Spirit being poured out upon, upon the people when they, when, they, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, John... John came, right? John the Baptist came, and he said, I am not the Messiah. There's one coming after me who is much greater than I am. I'm not even worthy to, to tie his shoes, my paraphrase. I baptize with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's pretty cool. By the way, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I do speak in tongues. However... One of the teachings that's out there in Charismania, Pentecostal land, is that unless you speak in tongues, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First off, that's not in here. Nowhere is it in here. Now, that is, it is an initial evidence, but there are those that teach it as the initial evidence. In other words, unless you do this, this didn't happen. It's not in here. I don't see it biblically, and I haven't seen it experiential either. Um, I know lots of people who have been used mightily by God who don't speak in tongues. 
I don't think they're doing it in their own strength. I know people who have been used in other spiritual gifts but don't speak in tongues. I don't know why. Maybe they have a mental block. I don't, I don't understand it. But I believe that you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, completely filled, overflowing, and not speak in tongues. Now, Paul says, I wish you all spoke in tongues. He says that. And he also says, don't deny the speaking in tongues. But it's not the initial evidence, it's an evidence. So I think one of the problems is that, that we put this pressure on people. We're going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for you, and you better speak in tongues or else it didn't happen. Well, it happens by faith, just like salvation. And you just got to believe that Jesus is the baptizer, and he's true to his word. And if you ask him, he gives it to you. Now, I think of people like Billy Graham. Do you think that Billy Graham had the Holy Spirit in him, the overflowing? He had, a, he had quite a ministry, didn't he? I don't think he ever spoke in tongues. Bill Bright, I know never did because he wrote about it. Bill Bright's ministry has reached more people for Jesus Christ than any other ministry before or since. I believe that he was spirit-filled. He didn't have a revelation of what that meant, perhaps. But I know he had a vision. He had, a, he had an out-of-body vision. Get this. So there's this Southern Baptist dude who has a vision. I mean, like, full cinematic vision of the call of God on his life, but he never spoke in tongues. How can that be? Well, because the Holy Spirit doesn't care if you speak in tongues all that much. He wants you to be used for His glory. So, anyhow, that's that gift of, that gift, the initial evidence is what happened on that day, and hopefully that happens among us. But if you're one of those people who have been in that place where you feel like you're second class because you didn't get it, maybe you got it. Amen? So lift that off from you. Number two, the miraculous ability to speak a language unknown by the speaker that is miraculously interpreted to the hearers. Now, this is the classic gift of tongues that should be in operation in the church. This is unknown by the speaker. So I stand up and I jabber away. I have no idea what I said. I sit down and I pray and I hope that somebody else interprets this thing because otherwise it's just jabbering. It doesn't do any good if nobody understands it. Amen? So, and it tells you to pray. It tells you if you speak in tongues, pray for the interpretation. So if somebody else doesn't get it, maybe you get it. We'll get to interpretation in a second. Pardon? Oh, that shouldn't say interrupted. That should say interpreted. The spell checker didn't check it. I spelled interrupted, right? So if somebody's speaking in tongues, don't interrupt them, interpret them. <laughs> See, I'm still being humble. <clears throat> Number three, the miraculous ability to speak or sing in a language unknown by the speaker in private prayer, praise, or worship. There's a couple of things here, if, and we'll see this scripture right here, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 15 says, for if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. But if I don't understand what I'm saying, what shall I do? I will pray in the Spirit. I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words that I don't understand. However, there's another piece of little scripture in 1 Corinthians 14 says, if unless there's an interpreter, you shouldn't speak in tongues in public. So this is, this is, this is my position. This differs from some people that I love very, very much. But this is my position. I'm trying to be true from my understanding, my revelation of what this says to the best of my ability. This form of praying and speaking and singing in tongues is for your private use. The only time that should happen, in my humble opinion, in a public setting is if everybody in the room is in the same place understanding-wise. So if I'm, in a, if I'm on a Sunday morning and there's people here that, that don't know what I'm talking about, they don't understand, have never been taught, never been filled with the Holy Spirit, never, whatever, then that's not the place for me to go into private prayer, language, or singing unless there's an interpretation. Because otherwise it does no good. That's, I mean, we really don't have time to go into it, but if you read 1 Corinthians 14, it's pretty clear that tongues without interpretation 
is only between you and God. But tongues with interpretation is the same as prophecy. But this speaking in tongues is for me. This is to build myself up. This is the direct connection. Have you ever, have you ever watched Batman when you were little? You pick up the bat phone. This is the direct line to God. This bypasses my thinking. And, and it's funny because I think about this even now. I said it in 2013 and I'll say it again now. Sometimes I think it's almost like the lazy man's prayer. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. Maybe I'm all prayed out. I've prayed for everything I can think of and I've, I've done all I can do. And then I just let my spirit pray through me. And I begin to just praise him and worship him in, in a language that I don't know, but he knows. Does that make sense? I know this is really fast and it's late and you're probably hungry and you've got a turkey in the oven for, thir- for Thanksgiving. And, but anyhow, the interpretation, I spelled it right here, praise God. The interpretation of tongues, it's pretty simple. It's the interpretation of what was said in tongues. So if I stand up in a, in a public meeting and I give a word in tongues, if you have the gift, the manifestation of the interpretation of tongues, you will stand up and interpret what I've said. Now, interpretation and translation are two different things. Am I right, Jess? Jess is an excellent interpreter, by the way. Jessica, you are an excellent interpreter. I've used you in that way. Of course, I didn't know what you were saying, so... <laughs> There's always that, I guess. <laughs> but the interpretation is not the translation. Now, if, if, if Jessica were trying to translate for me, there's words that don't match. There's, there's things that just, they don't fit language to language. But the interpretation is not necessarily the words, it's the idea. So if you're interpreting a gift of tongues, have you ever been in a meeting where somebody has a, has a word in tongues and it goes on for like, forever. The interpretation is like three words. I'm like, how does that work? <laughs> it's the interpretation, not the translation. Or maybe it's the other way around. And I'll never forget the first time I gave a word in tongues. I was a brand new baby in the Lord. I was at a Bible study in Sutton, Vermont. And I gave this word, and I'm like, God, I hope somebody interprets it. Because, you know, that's it's pretty easy just to, to go for it, but then it's like there's the pressure of, well, what happens if nobody interprets it? Does that mean that I was wrong? Does that mean that I didn't really have a, a, a word in tongues? And uh, What do I do with that? Take that off and don't worry about it. It's God's problem, not yours. It says, it says to pray that you might interpret, so that's a good prayer. So if nobody else does, maybe he gives you the interpretation. If nobody else has the interpretation... Maybe they had the interpretation, but they were rebellious. And they sat on their hands. And when you do that, by the way, you're robbing the ones that God intended it for. Wow, I never thought of that before. So the interpretation of tongues is simply the miraculous ability given by the Holy Spirit to speak a language understood by the speaker, the meaning of words previously spoken in an unknown language. So that could happen, uh, the gift of tongues spoken, the interpretation of those tongues. But here's something I never really thought about. It could be that I am in the Dominican Republic, and I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to understand what somebody's saying in Spanish or Creole or French or whatever. I have no idea what they're saying, but God tells me what they're saying. That's the interpretation of tongues. It's just fun stuff. Any of you want to pray in tongues? It builds you up. Come on. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Earnestly, zealously desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. So um, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to have you all stand up, um, and I'd like us all to just pray. And I may or may not walk around and touch some of you. Um, If you don't want to be touched, stay seated. How's that? Is that fair? Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we pray right now that you would come, and that you would activate, that you would impart, 
that you would meet our desires, God. I pray that every single person in this place, that you would meet the desire that you put on their heart, whether it's to prophesy or to have a gift of healing or to, to see miraculous things happen. Whatever it is, God, I pray that every single person's desire would be met and that they begin to be activated in those things. And God, we just pray that you would 